Our next speaker is Kenneth Sassaman. He is the Hyatt and C.C. Brown Professor of Florida Archaeology in the Department of Anthropology at the University of Florida. He earned his Ph.D. in Anthropology from the University of Massachusetts, Amherst, and he's also worked for 11 years previously with the Savannah River Archaeological Research Program of the South Carolina Institute of Archaeology and Anthropology at the University of South Carolina. His field research in Florida has centered on the mid-Holocene hunter-gatherers of the middle St. John's River Valley. In 2009, Sassman launched the Lower Suwannee Archaeological Survey to develop data on coastal living pertinent to the challenges of sea level rise today. Thanks, Jimmy. Good morning, everyone. Well, I don't mind telling you that I had never heard of maritime cultural landscapes before Mike Russo called me a couple months ago. And, um, and so he said, oh, why don't you read Wester, Westerdahl and Ben Ford's intro to his book? And I did that day. And I uh, found a few points of entry. It was encouraged that I actually could contribute something. I certainly was encouraged that it would give me an opportunity to do what's been nagging at me since midlife crisis, which is make archaeology more relevant to policy issues and moving forward as a society. So that, that, was, that was encouraging. But also, I've always, I've always been embracing the landscape concept, uh, not necessarily with any theoretical uh, perspective in particular. But I guess if you had to pigeonhole me, I'm a phenomenologist. And all that sounds really scary and stuff. It really is just the study of subjectivity of experience. So as archaeologists, we can't get to the subjects. At least I study aboriginal uh, human experiences in the new world. Um, so you know, we're at a loss there. Um, we certainly can document experience in some sort of material sense. We can look at the biophysical world that people inhabited, how they made a living, the resources they collected, where they chose to live, bury their dead, and so forth. That's the bread and butter of archaeology. Certainly, we can do that pretty well. The, uh, the, the subjectivity of it, though, um, short of having indigenous input, and I, I'm a little uh, you know, envious of my, my colleagues working in the Northwest Coast and California and so forth that have descendant communities. I once said that at Berkeley once, uh, and Sonia Adelay, when she was still a student there, said, just ask any Indian. And by that she meant basically, just, just think about it outside those that were victimized by the Enlightenment, Cartesian reductionism. Uh, and everything else that makes us uh, descendants of European ontologies. In other words, think outside the box, think th differently about it. So when we started this project on the northern Gulf Coast in 2009, from a, you know, kind of a phenomenological perspective, although not patently so, uh, it involved more than archaeology. It involved getting in that community of Cedar Key, that old fishing community, and, and doing ethnographic work. It meant doing experimental work. It meant being in that environment, being in that place, learning what it was like to live with those tides and those winds and those storms, what it was like when you had a blowout tide in the winter, and so forth. So it's kind of a holistic approach to it, I suppose. Ultimately, the experiential part that I'm investigating ties into sea level rise issues from the perspective of temporality. Uh, at what rate uh, of change is necessary for human perception to form cultural traditions of enduring quality and value that would enable people to intervene against alternative futures, to basically you know, take care of their own futures and not live by fate alone. And that's part of the bias of a Western mind that we think of the non-Western peoples of the world being subject to fate alone. And that's just patently not the case in an environment that's really dynamic like that. So um, I have three objectives here. Uh, conceptually, we'll just quickly go through some of this, and I'll show you some of the results here. So one is that. I, I think as an outsider, maybe I can bring a little fresh perspective, although I was encouraged yesterday by some of the talks that touch on these points here, that uh, MCL should be regarded as relational phenomena, not essential phenomena, uh, clearly not bounded in time and space. So structured by motion. And with motion, you get not only movement across space, but that's the basis for time. It's the basis for temporality. How do we recognize when time elapses? When things move, whether it's that clock or people traversing the landscape or tides coming and going and so forth. The second thing, and I think this is really where, for me, it, 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 the rubber hits the road, is that we have to think of his, the historical value of anything archaeologically, including the MCLs, residing in futures planning, not just putting something under glass and preserving it as if it has intrinsic value because it happened in the past, but that we mobilize what we know about past experiences for planning for long-term futures. And again, I think what we have in our indigenous uh, counterparts in the ancient past, a sense of temporality that outstrips Western minds Man manifold, that they were operating at scales of centuries, perhaps even more with inscribed memories that could be millennial scale. And then I'll just quickly review some of the results of the ongoing survey project of uh, the northern Gulf Coast that's informed by these precepts. 
So the first thing, MCL is in motion, uh, multifaceted perspective on this in my mind. And the one that comes to mind most readily that nobody could argue with is that there's intrinsic movements in coastal environments that you can just see on a on a on a minute-by-minute uh, -minute basis that water's moving constantly. There's the tides, of course, they're diurnal. The currents that flow constantly, sediments moving around, biota, including uh, the human uh, bodies themselves. Uh, there's just constant movement. It's the first thing that struck me working out there. I'm a land lover, and uh, you know, from a land perspective, there's times when I think the world has stood still, but that's not possible in the northern Gulf Coast, and I don't think that's true of any coastal environment as well as riverine environments. Extrinsic movements are, are things that come from outside. I think Westerdahl, near the end of his article, brings, to, brings out the point that MCLs have to be uh, open-ended because there's movements of things in and out of them. Certainly storm events precipitated by uh, global forcing variables, El Ninos and things like that. Uh, migrations of, of human a humans and animals and so forth uh, have you know, extra local uh, points of origin and, and consequences. And then it gets more interesting when you start looking at the variations in scale. And this gets really complex. It's hard to model this kind of stuff, but there's so many scalar questions about movement. The things that occur on a minute-by-minute -minute basis, we got you know, decadal, we got century scale things, we got millennial scale things. All that stuff, of course, um, can be modeled as natural phenomena. And then we have the human elements, too, of, of things like building environment, the infrastructure that's put in place, uh, the, the sense of duration, uh, permanence that goes into things like that. Um, and then, you know, abandonment and dismantlement of those sorts of things. And then for me, the real critical value here in looking at all this movement is the synergies of the movement. This is where it gets really complex. It requires really detailed data, interdisciplinary data. I'm learning a lot about this environment that I never uh, imagined I'd ever uh, have to learn, but it is relevant, that things like marsh aggradation on the northern Gulf Coast keeps pace with sea level. So, in fact, you do get... Uh, long stretches of time where although water's coming up through eustatic sea level rise, marsh aggradations keeping pace with it, so things are both rising, rising simultaneously like that. But if you take the oyster bioherms that enable that aggradation and you start impacting those by increasing salinity levels, by decreasing freshwater input into the estuaries, estuarine environments, you, you basically break down that barrier that's keeping that water and that sediment in place and you get this overstepping effect that can really strip those environments of their base levels near shore quickly and produce these instantaneous eventful changes in that landscape. So the synergies are really critical here, and that's the complexity of experience, the human experience of knowing the combination of winds, tides, salinity, the, the viability and the health of the oyster bio, bioherms, all that stuff is relevant. All that stuff requires very complex uh, knowledge, and it doesn't require PhDs, but it does require a lot of experience out there. So the locals know. Uh, they're not indigenous people, they're you know, you know, uh, descendants of, of European colonists, but they know what it's like to be out there, and so we're learning from them too. And then, of course, it's all relational in the sense, as opposed to essentialist, because it's connected through movement of uh, both time and space. The future part of this uh, uh, perspective for me uh, is, is, is twofold. One is that uh, the sense that we study the past for the future. There's all those old adages that we can cite uh, and isn't it nice? They're all platitudes in my mind. Uh, the, the, the spirit of the law may be that we study the past to plan for the futures, but the letter of the law doesn't specify that. There's nothing in law that says every archaeological site that's, that's identified as being significant must have a component that can be mobilized for futures planning. I know when I looked at the Sea Grants, the first thing the Sea Grant Administrator at the University of Florida told me was, hey, Archaeology is cool and all that, but how can we, you know, package it in a way that will help the economic viability of these coastal communities? How can we package it in a way that's going to help us understand the ecological sustainability of these local environments? So he was telling me straight up, he's like, your stuff does not have intrinsic value. It has to be packaged and mobilized for application, applied anthropology, right? Uh, everyone loves archaeology. It has intrinsic value as an aesthetic, as an entertainment value and all that. But to make it policy relevant, having a place at uh, you know, the boards of industry and, and the tables of the lawmakers and so forth is going to require a different way of thinking about archaeology. And that leads to the second point of view, which is that instead of looking at archaeology as an archive of extinct experiences and past humans who lived these lives and then became you know, something else, they evolved into something else, then we look at the archaeological record as an archive of alternative futures. Uh, not, not just the ones that we can mobilize for our own futures, but the sense that all our ancient counterparts um, intervened in their worlds to determine their own fate, that they stepped in and took care through their own experiences, 
uh, what was to come. And that really is a matter of perception, a matter of recognizing long-term patterns, knowing when those patterns are disrupted, knowing how to deal with those disruptions. Certainly there's moments of time or events that occurred in the archaeological past where there was no prior experience that would enable people to understand how to move forward effectively. And those sorts of revolutionary moments I think we see in the archaeological record all the time. Jeff talked about one there, the cosmological uh, transformation from, from Swift Creek to Wheaton Island may in fact coincide with, with a major event, uh, environmental event like that. And then the last thing I guess conceptually here for me is this idea that it doesn't have to be linear, it doesn't have to be continuous. One of the dilemmas we face as archaeologists is that if we're going to look at the ancient past and try to bring it towards the future, do we in fact have continuity of practice or do we have continuity of, of, of human lineages, actual traditions that would uh, allow us to talk about it as homology, as descendant practice as opposed to analogical stuff. And I don't think that matters. I think this was a point that Jim Delgado made yesterday with regard to shipwrecks no longer being on the, on the, on the, on the beach. As long as there's a memory there, there's a, there's a carry forward of value and meaning that could be reinterpreted and redeployed for various purposes, but it doesn't require that continuity of material presence for that to happen. I think that's true in these landscapes because they accreted not only in marsh environments of sediments and so forth, but there's a lot of anthropogenic stuff there that just makes that world patently a product of what happened a long time ago. The town of Cedar Key, for instance, wouldn't exist today if it didn't have two to three meters of shell midden that accumulated between 4,000 and 2,000 years ago beneath it. It would be underwater, right? So this is our survey area. I'm going to go through this really fast because we don't have that much time, of course. Uh, I'm like the rest of these guys. I could talk on forever, but I, I didn't want to write this down because I think that you know, gets a little tedious, too. So here you go. That's our study area. It's about 40 kilometers from Cedar Key to Horseshoe Beach and the so-called Big Bend area. There's not a lot of uh, physiographic detail here, but I do have the shoreline at 5,500 years ago and that dotted line out there. The gray uh, polygons there are the, uh, the oyster bioherms that formed after 5,000 years ago. Uh, much, much, much reduced these days because of changes in salinity and rising sea and so forth. And pretty much like uh, Todd Rajay's uh, methodology, we go out and just, you know, survey uh, this coastline. It's a crenulated one. To show you some of the USGS, uh, USGS topos, a little more detail. Archipelago that is the Cedar Key area, uh, another uh, area with a lot of uh, sea islands, uh, small little uh, tree hammocks and, and other sorts of hammocks there. We also have just a plethora of these relic dunes that formed in the late Ice Age. Uh, they are the major source of sediment. The Suwannee River going through karst topography doesn't carry much sediment down. You wouldn't really have an estuarine environment without both the combination of fresh water and sediment for uh, seagrass development, the, the, uh, the marsh development, aggradation, and so forth. So these, these dunes as they eroded with sea level rise provided all that sediment being trapped behind these oyster reefs uh, to allow the aggradation to occur. So there's a lot of that. There's the mouth of there's the Swanee, the, the delta of the Swanee, which is the center point of our study area. Moving further north, uh, another area there that doesn't have a lot of um, islands and a lot of, of dunes, but a great deal of tidal creek development. And then another little point that sticks out there at Horseshoe Beach. Uh, each one of these areas is what we call a survey track, and we go out and do like Todd was saying, we basically just go out and survey the coastlines here. They're, they're very conspicuous. Uh, they're also, each one of these, the center of a civic ceremonial center during Swift Creek and Wheaton Island times, so post AD 200, between about that and 900, each one of those boxes there contains at least one mound center that had a large resident population and a mortuary complex associated with it. And some of those boxes contain more than one, but they each have at least one. So they're, they're roughly spaced evenly apart, and they do map onto the physiography in a way that, that kind of makes sense too intuitively. Yeah, this is what it looks like when you just go around with canoes and so forth. We found or I shouldn't say we, uh, local citizens found most of the sites for us long before we started working there. And many of the responsible citizens that have done this reported it to the state and turned over collections to us. So we have these massive collections and there's two guys in particular that picked up everything, uh, including little tiny pieces of, of uh, nondescript pottery and, and shell and so forth. And they kept it all separate so they had site local provenience, bless their hearts. Uh, in addition to that, on, on these dunes, when these dunes, uh, and, and the local collectors laughed at us when we started surveying the dunes, because the dunes are basically free of any surface deposits generally, but quite a few of them have these anthropogenic deposits we refer to as terraforming uh, these days, because they were deliberately constructed in many cases, these big U-shaped things, much like Jeff was talking about during that same era of Swift Creek and Wheaton Island. None of these date back as early as the late archaic, like Matt was talking about, but we do have uh, quite a few of these, and some of them, are, like the bottom left there, are just small little domestic rings, and then the one to the upper right, and then, of course the garden patch site to the upper left there. 
much more massive constructions that have the mortuary complexes uh, with them as well. We see these uh, in each one of those uh, uh, survey tracks. I think altogether, uh, we got about two dozen now that we would call anthropogenic constructions that were deliberate, not just de facto, not just trash, as Jeff's pointed out. The, these things are, 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 are cited in ways that would suggest that um, they also have uh, alignments to uh, solstices, perhaps other celestial uh, alignments as well. Some of the archaeology below the ground, there's just an incredible array of features at all these sites, lots of post holes. We haven't quite dug enough. Our, our sampling's been extensive and not intensive excavation at any site yet. But as you can see, there's post holes that show up. The one on the upper right there, or uh, the second from the upper right, we sometimes get chinking of shell uh, in the post. I don't know that that's technological as much as it is uh, ritual or symbolic. Uh, and then the bottom uh, left there, these massive pits, much like the ones that Matt was talking about, these aren't late archaic, these date to the last 2,000 years. And uh, they're, they're, there's places where they're digging dozens of these things, and they could be two meters wide and two meters deep. And they're in sand, so they're not, they're not lasting very long. They could be lined with something, if, if so, I don't know what. But they are richly infilled sometimes, that's kind of cool. And then the stratigraphy, which is really what makes me so happy. Um, you know, these, these, are, these are history books, right? They're layered out in ways that not only record human use of the landscape, and we can, of course, mine these things as we do for changes in environment and diet and all that good stuff. But we also have recorded in here, like the upper left uh, and the next one uh, to it on the right, uh, geological events of storm surge deposits. So we have you know, abandonments that are followed, or things that are precipitated, abandonments precipitated by storm surge events that are then reoccupied sites that then, uh, after that have uh, additional abandonments and so forth. So we have these incredible records when we put that chronology together. Um, we only have, what do we got now? I just got 16 dates coming in this week. So we'll have up to 87 now. Just the beginning. In my mind, to get a chronology that will work for this, to look at sea level rise, to look at the human response to sea level rise, how they intervene against these changes, it's going to take somewhere between 500 and 1,000. So you do the math on this $600 a pop on AMS. Uh, it'll take a while to accumulate that kind. We have plenty of carbon to date. I don't date shell. I don't ever want to date shell unless they get local reservoir like they did on St. Catharines. You've got to do that. But in any event, we've got these gaps. And so the gap, the goal now is to figure out, are the gaps real or imagined? Is it a sampling bias or whatnot? And to put it into a more uh, uh, interpretable perspective, the vertical bars here, the one on the left is 2300 BC, the one at 400 BC, and the one at 200 AD, those vertical bars there are geologically established overstepping of the coastline, points where the aggradation of the marsh and rise in sea level got out of whack. We get the overstepping of the water and immediate transgression as much as three kilometers at a, at a pop that flooded the, the near shore environment and created uh, havoc. And so we get after each one of those abandonments, we think, and then the reestablishment of these populations elsewhere or the returning to these landforms when, in fact, through human aggradation of the anthropogenic deposits, it was possible to reestablish themselves at a lower elevation. So real quick, uh, four examples of what I call alternative futures. Ultimately, we're trying to reconstruct um, as best we can the details of human responses to these events and these longer term processes. And one of which is that we see, and I think uh, we see this with, with Todd's example of the early Holocene stuff, as well as what Matt was talking about, that late archaic peoples in particular on the right there, or in the, excuse me, on the left, uh, sea level at that point on the left was down um, about a meter, and so the coastline was five, or ten, five to ten kilometers to the west of that. So those sites there that date to 4,000 years ago, they were at higher elevation then and landward, and they had the full suite of marine resources. So they're taking tidal creeks out to the water to collect the resources to get back. So they're coastal setbacks. It's smart. It's what we should always have been done, doing, right? Uh, it's where Miami should have been, was like on the next ridge back, not like where it is today. And then when we look at the right, this is actually the more recent time, which actually shows that along Tidal Creeks. So in the upper left of that, that right map there, you see those polygons up the Tidal Creeks. Those are the habitation sites during uh, the last 1,500 years, and then they're going down those Tidal Creeks to do that. Alternative features, too, there were times, like Jeff was talking about, where they're relocating burials. I have uh, had the experience years ago of there was cemetery washing out of, at an island called McClamory Key, and with the, uh, the blessing and the help of the Seminole Tribe of Florida, because people were looting these exposed burials that date to 4,500 years ago, we went in there and got them out, and they're going to be reburied. But ultimately, when we were doing this, I was like, why are they putting bodies in the ground 
right there at the water's edge. Well, no, of course they weren't. At the time, sea level was down a meter. The coastline was five kilometers to the west. They're all secondary burials. So I have this hypothesis that I'm working on this theory that actually they anticipated the need to relocate the burials with ambient rises in sea level over a period of time when, in fact, the rate was, suffi was sufficiently high that you could notice it in a lifetime, that they're anticipating the need to relocate uh, their settlements by first taking their cemeteries and relocating them landward about five kilometers, and then after that, through these sequences that we have documented, relocating the living communities, and then when they abandon those living communities and placing caches of soapstone vessels that are being acquired from hundreds of kilometers to the north there. So this interesting sequence of the ceremonial process of taking the bodies, moving them landward, and so forth. This is all laid out on the solstice grid, similar to what um, Jeff was talking about. And I've actually, if you're interested, I can give you a paper where I've extrapolated this all the way to Poverty Point. Poverty Point in Louisiana, to me, is a, the end result of 2,000 years of experience dealing with sea level rise. Using the solstice reference grid enabled these, these people to anticipate change, the rate of change, and make what seemed to be chaotic, uh, ordered, and, and, and predictable, right? So they were able to, like, bring order to a world of, of, of constant change. So the third one, terraforming and placemaking, when at AD 200 we get the establishment of the large civic ceremonial centers, they're sited back from the coast. Crystal River is seven kilometers back from the coastline. Garden Patch is three kilometers back from the coastline. Shell Mound, not so much, but at least they're on the dunes, so they go up higher there. So these are places where investments and in infrastructure were made that were huge, but they did it in places that were much more secure at the time. And then finally, these are places of gathering. So ultimately, the, the last uh, alternative futures here for them was networking, ultimately the fate of coastal people today as it was back then, really dependent on their connections with other people in the interior. Things are flowing to the coast, but also populations are moving to the interior at the time when it's necessary for them, for them to abandon sites. I think we see that at that point of AD 700 that Jeff was talking about, that we do get these massive shifts in populations landward. This is what Miami needs, so uh, social scientists of the future figure out the networks of Miami population, start relocating enclaves landward um, and one could be Gainesville, Florida. We'd love to have some better Cuban food up there. <laughs> Talk to you guys later. Thanks.